Good evening. I'm Kelly Garipkin, National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Women's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. A Women's Journey strives to improve your well being through health education. Genetics, the blueprints that lay the foundation for who we are, what we look like, and the health conditions we inherit play a role in every disease. Tonight, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ambrose Wonkum, Johns Hopkins Professor of Genetic Medicine and Director of the McCusick Nathans Institute of Genetic Medicine and the Department of Genetic Medicine. So please use the Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to the doctor who will respond during the last 20 minutes of tonight's conversation. Our webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. this evening. And I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance. You can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Wonkum. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you to, to all of you uh, looking at tonight and thank you to Hopkins for giving us the opportunity to share some of our thoughts and also some of our uh, public engagement on genetic medicine. Uh, tonight, I would like to convince you that uh, genetic can help us uh, to better understand the disease and also uh, their uh, treatment. We all start with a very important project that was developed here in the, in the United States and lasted about 10 years. The project was completed 20 years ago and it was called the Human Genome Project. This was a massive enterprise that allowed us to understand our uh, genome uh, from A to uh, Z. And the way we understood it is like a big library of life uh, organized uh, in 23 pairs of uh, shelves. And the shelf, we call it technically chromosomes. And within the shelves, we have uh, the genes. And the genes, uh, we can call it books, books of life. And uh, those shelves and, and the books actually define the biology and the way we are. And the since the completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003, every single day, new disease genes have been found. And that led to the need to have uh, doctors that are specialized in genetic condition, medical geneticists like myself. And those doctors, of course, investigate uh, the use of a uh, genetic uh, toward understanding uh, both the disease and, and the treatment. And tonight I would like to uh, explore the journey of consulting a medical uh, geneticist uh, with you. Let's start uh, of the spectrum of all the diseases that we have. We have on one end genetics condition, on the other end environmental condition. The best example of environmental diseases are, for example, infection, HIV or malaria or malnutrition because those one definitively are because we have been affected by a direct environmental hazard. At the other end, we have genetics condition and this genetic condition can be either due to a mistake in a single gene, in other words, it changes in a book of the library of life or it changes in the chromosomes. In other words, the changes in shelves and this change in shelf can be either numbers or it can be either structure of the shelf. The numbers, for example, is Down syndrome, I'll come back to that. In between the genetic and environmental condition, we have everything that we call complex condition. The complex condition are like you have the blood pressure that uh, associate genetic factor and environmental factor or diabetes mellitus. And, uh, in the, the, and the cancers that we uh, all know are by definition a genetic diseases because uh, all cancer usually starts by one single mutation and then the cells start to behave very differently in terms of his multiplications. So what is genetic medicine in practice? How can we take advantage of our knowledge of the genome to improve health and also uh, to understand diseases? Well, I would like to classify uh, the conditions that are mostly genetics. And the single gene disorder, those, gene, those conditions that are due to a changes or a mutation in one gene, one of the 20,000 genes that we have, 
usually mendelizes in family. In other words, we can see them in a, in a cluster in family, either from generation to generation. And this pattern of having at least one person in the family that have the condition for each generation is called dominant. From time to time, we may have those conditions all called recessive because they're all in one generation. On the right-hand side in the middle of your screen, it is a pedigree of a family with sickle cell disease. You can notice that the round and dark shape of those children that are affected, they're all in the same generation. This, uh, this uh, transmission is called recessive. Another way of identifying a pattern of transmission in a family is called X-linked recessive. The third uh, gener uh, pedigree on the right lower hand side shows a condition in which only balls here represented by square and uh, black square are affected. And in those conditions, generally the mothers uh, are carriers. And of course, for all these a single gene disorder, whether they are dominant recessive or a sex X link, usually the manifestation within the family are very different. What we call a clinical expression are very different. This is one example of a single gene disorder. Uh, you probably heard about it. It's called sickle cell disease. It is a blood disease due to a single mutation that usually confer a resistance uh, to malaria. It's a condition that is very common in sub-Saharan Africa and it's disturbed. The mutation allows the distortion of a red blood cell. Instead of having a round shape, the red blood cell will have a banana shape. As you can see on the panel on the top right hand side of your screen. And if we move from the disease of books, the genes, to the disease of the shelf, the chromosomes, uh, the one way of having those conditions is to have a numbers that is not 23 pairs. For example, uh, this child with Down syndrome on the top right-hand side have three chromosome number 21, and a genetics will call it trisomy 21. And from time to time, you don't have you have the right number of chromosome, but you have a changes in the structure of the chromosome. These changes can be either part of the chromosome that is deleted. In other words, imagine a shelf with one ray of book that is missing. And uh, the child on the lower left hand side has a condition called a prader willi syndrome because part of his chromosome 15 is deleted. And another way for us as a geneticist to recognize this chromosomal abnormality is to have specific characteristic, facial characteristic of a child. For example, this young child have a condition that we call velocardiac facial syndrome. The name is not important, but on the chromosome number 22, or in other words, on the shelf number 22, at a specific address that we call 22Q11, there is a missing. And this would lead to a specific facial, that facial facial that, that this child presents. We call it dysmorphic sign. And a narrow nose, a, a sometimes they will have cleft palate. And most of the time, they will have a heart malformation. And the combination of the three will allow the genetics to say, this might be that condition. Again, another condition due to a structural changes in one chromosome, this young kid have a condition called we call Williams syndrome. And in this specific condition, there is also a heart defect and these uh, children usually have a very strong expressive language. The way they speak, you can barely notice that they have an intellectual disability, but actually their capacity to visualize the space is very limited. If you look at the part on the lower right-hand side on your screen, you will see the reproduction of the letter G. A child with Williams syndrome like this, a young boy will not be able to write the G, even though he can speak very clearly, compared to a child with Down syndrome that can reproduce very well. But if you have both children at the same age, 
you cannot imagine that a child with this condition called Williams syndrome uh, will, be, will not be able to reproduce a G because they can speak extremely well. And as a geneticist, we have a whole map of those addresses on those pairs of chromosomes that are specifically associated with specific syndromes for which we give a name. The name usually is the name of the doctor that first described the condition. And we spoke, we just spoke about single gene disorder, those conditions due to mutation in one gene, or there was a little mistake in one book, or chromosomal abnormalities, those conditions due to either an addition of shelves or a deletion in power of power of the shelves. Multifactorial disorder, like for example, this child with a cleft palate or the other child with a spina bifida, usually is a combination of environmental factor and a genetic factor. And this is the case for all complex conditions that we have. You probably have family or nose family in which you know diabetes mellitus run from generation to generation. You feel that there may be something genetic, but of course, if you have those predisposition, if you manage your, your lifestyle and have the appropriate physical activity, you may not develop diabetes. So these type of condition are called complex disorder. This is also the case of schizophrenia. If you are in the right environment, maybe the disease will not evolve uh, as if you were in a more stressful environment. Or bipolar disorder, we know uh, the condition like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder runs into family, but the way people express it will be very uh, different. And complex disorder, usually people with complex disorder, family with complex disorder, is usually very difficult to assess because sometimes we cannot always pinpoint the genes associated with this condition. So again, I will summarize uh, with, with one image on how geneticists see diseases. In one case, we have what we call a single gene disorder. Usually they are very simple in the way we understand them. Cystic fibrosis is one example of a single gene disorder usually due to a change in one specific genes. But of course, you will still have some small fraction of environmental factor and maybe some other changes in other genes that may influence the way the patient can be severe or not. On the other hand, we have much more common, complex, multigenic diseases. And these conditions do not follow a specific pattern of inheritance within family what we will call non-Mendelian. And usually they are a combination of multiple changes in multiple genes and the lifestyle in uh, all, as well as the environmental exposure. So how does a medical geneticist work with all this information? The role of a medical geneticist is to use genetic variation from our genome uh, to uh, try to understand those variations, like the changes, later changes in the, our genome, explain it uh, to our patient and to our client and to help the patient understand the variation and how this will impact the disease or the treatment of the disease in that specific patient. So why are we so different in health and disease because of variation? Can we individualize our health and needs according to the genetic variation we have? Can we risk stratify specific expression of a condition? Can we use the knowledge of variation in our genome to design specific gene therapy? Can we use those variations instead uh, for, to understand the way we um, process medication? Uh, all those questions are the question that a geneticist asks in on the day-to-day -day basis in their consultation. Who are genetic professionals? We have two categories of genetic professionals. The first group are those professionals like myself that work in clinical environment. You have the clinical geneticists or medical geneticists. Usually they are doctors specialized in genetics. 
We have genetic counselors that are usually people with master in sciences that have a specific training to allow them to be genetic counselor. And we also have genetic nurses. Those are nurses that actually have a specific skill in understanding genetic diseases and communicate them to patients. The second group of professional geneticists are laboratory geneticists. It can move to people working a director of lab, lab and those labs are usually diagnostic lab. Those of those specialists that study chromosomes, uh, in other words, the shelves in our genome are called cytogeneticists. Those ones that study the DNA, uh, or the words the later in the books are called molecular geneticists. And usually this group of people are work with specific technician called medical technologists. I must say the, these three categories are not so distinguishable today because the speciality have evolved. And all these professionals, whether they are clinical or laboratory, are all board certified, governed by specific professional associations. So let's now talk about genetic services. How does a genetic consultation work? Uh, what happens, for example, if you go and see a genetic doctor? A genetic consultation generally involves the evaluation of the person in front of us, but also the understanding on how one specific threat or a disease runs into a family. Usually we aim at confirming a diagnostic or ruling out a genetic condition in, as one specific objective of the consultation. We aim as, at identifying or arranging for other medical management issue. We usually uh, calculate or evaluate the specific risk for the con a condition or a genetic changes in the family and communicate that risk in the way that the patient can understand. And we provide and arrange psychosocial support for patients and families. So where do we start? We usually start with the what I would call the cheapest genetic test in the world, which is a family tree. We spend a lot of time asking questions around families. And this information include uh, the name of the father, the age, the mother, and usually we ask questions on at least three generations. We ask about consanguinity in some part of the world. Marry the cousin is normal. We call it consanguinity. We speak to parental age, as you can already perhaps know, when the mother age increases, there is more risk, for example, for Down syndrome. When the father age increases, there is more risk for some single gene disorder. We ask about miscarriages that if it's repetitive can be associated with specific genetic condition. We ask about mental disability or intellectual disability, or if there's any potential people with malformation or non-malformation in the family. We ask about what happened around the pregnancy where you had, did you have fever, what medication are you take, were you taking, were you a little bit not well during pregnancy. We add digital around the birth of the child, the, 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 the age of gestation, what time where the, and where the child was delivered. We asked about the birth, the birth weight and so on. And of course, we also asked a few details on behavior of the person. And every single time we uh, de de design a family tree, there are symbols that are universal. On the right, left-hand side is the way uh, the symbol on standardly uh, identify people. Square is male. Around is female. When a, a specific symbol is made black, it means that the person is affected by a specific condition. If we put a number in a symbol, it represents the number of people in the family. When we cross the symbol, it means that the person is dead, and so on, and so on. On the right hand side is the relationship between people. If we have a straight line, it means that it's a marriage or a partnership. If it's a double line, it means that it's a cons there is a consanguinity. In other words, the two partners have a specific family relation. 
if the line is crossed with only one bar, it means separated with two bars, it means divorce. So we have specific symbols that allow all geneticists in the world to understand and to interpret family trees in a very specific and consistent way. So after the family tree part, we examine in this exact physical examine patient in, a, in like in any other doctor, but usually as a geneticist, we focus on specific things like the growth of it, the child or the pattern of growth of the child. We look at a few clues that may indicate some uh, genetic condition and we call it dysmorphic. Dysmorphic doesn't mean a malformation, it just means a variation of the norm. Of course, the variation of the norm may change according to ethnic background. Usually we're gonna take the photograph of our patient and from time to time, we may want to ask other colleagues uh, to uh, provide some specialist advice. For example, if I see a child for with these specific eyes, uh, the shape of the eyes, I'm pretty sure most of you in your houses already can identify this patient as potentially having Down syndrome. So those specific clues are very important for us uh, to know which condition can be associated with this specific look. And from time to time, if we do not have an answer, we use uh, some specific program, informatic program, where we introduce those tools in the computer and the computer will provide us with a few possibility of diagnostics. And the other element that we focus on in, is those minor changes that we can all have. On the top, in, on the top hand, uh, right hand side, you can see the first hand is mine. The second one is the one of a child that we saw in one of our clinics. There is a single crease in the middle of the palm of that child. He should have three of those and he have only one. That doesn't mean that there is something in wrong in the child. 3% in the population will have a single palmar crease, but if I have a bilateral single palmar crease in an individual child, I would tend to look at other abnormality because for example, children with Down syndrome, 80% of them will have this type of crease in both hands. So, and those minor abnormality in combination allow us uh, to uh, point a finger on specific direction. Uh, if, for example, if you have only one minor abnormality, it means generally not a lot. If you have two, there is 10% of chances to having a, another abnormality somewhere. If you have three, there is up to 20% of chances that you have a major abnormality somewhere. At that time, we start to uh, think about a genetic condition that may be associated with those little changes. And after examining the patient, the next step is what can be the diagnostic if we don't know, we will now start to think about uh, investigation. And uh, of course, that means some genetic testing. Uh, those genetic testing can be for the member of the family we see at our consultation or many other member in the family to refine our diagnostic. We also, uh, before any testing, provide a, a genetic counseling to make sure that our patient fully uh, understand what, why we are testing and what we will be testing and what will be the implication of the testing in terms of uh, diagnostic in terms of prevention and perhaps in terms of management. So what type of genetic test can we provide? We can provide what we call a clinical testing. And this clinical testing is usually a perform for the purpose of prevention, diagnostic, or can assist in provide appropriate treatment and care. And usually clinical testing are performed in accredited molecular diagnostic laboratory. The second type of testing is what we call research testing. That means that for this testing, we are still investigating what could be the changes associated to one specific condition. And it may not be performed in a molecular diagnostic lab, but rather in our research lab, 
but usually the patient and the family have to consent uh, for those testing because we cannot always provide the inappropriate answer at the end of the testing. Of genetic tests, what kind of genetic test do we have out there? At least three types of genetic testing. The first is what we call cytogenetic, which actually is for looking if there is any changes in numbers or the structure of chromosome. In other words, do, other words, do we have the 23 pairs of shelves or do we have 20, a, 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 a 46 chromosome or 47? Do we have a changes in the structure of those chromosomes? The second type is molecular diagnostic that use DNA. And the question here, do we have a mutation uh, or a mistake in the book, in the gene? And the last one is metabolic testing uh, that may use either your blood or your urine sample. And how do we do that? To do those testing, we need part of your body, and this can be a drop of blood. It can be the fluid around a baby, we call it amniotic fluid during pregnancy. It can be a little bit of section of a skin that we biopsy. Uh, from time to time, it can be bone marrow, specifically if we are looking for changes in specific cancer. When we have those material, biological material, we proceed in our lab. For example, we process them in a very specific way and we can observe uh, some of the changes under a microscope for cytogenetics. And for GNA testing, for example, usually we're gonna use blood and within the peripheral blood sample, the white blood cell that contain a nucleus and within which we have genetic material, we will extract GNA from that nucleus and then use the GNA uh, for specific investigation. And usually for the GNA investigation, we look at specific region of the genome that we photocopy and it's called polymerase chain reaction. I'm pretty sure you heard about PCR. It's just like multiple copy on part of a genome. And those multi copy, we will use a specific computer to read every single letters. And this is called sequencing. And the way it appeared, it appeared like the image on the lower hand side on your screen. And based on that image, we will say, okay, here we are not supposed to see a T in why do we have a, a C? And that means there is a mutation, there is a variation in that region that may explain the specific condition uh, in the child or in the person that we are seeing in our clinical uh, practice. Why do we need to test? We may want to test a patient or a family for diagnostic purpose. So we want to ask the question, what is the specific condition in this family? The second reason we need a genetic test is for prediction. For example, for late onset disorder uh, or like cancers, uh, for familiar cancer or for prediction in some situation of a heart failure uh, in some families. I'm sure some of you have looked at the soccer, European soccer tournament a couple of years ago where one Danish player fell uh, during a football match and nearly died. And usually those conditions are genetic conditions that can be tested. The third reason why we need to test is reproductive planning. Sometimes if you know that there's a one condition in your family, you may want to know if you carry that condition, if you can pass that condition to the next generation, or if you, the unborn child that a, a woman may have during pregnancy have the condition or not. And lastly, we do genetic testing for screening. And screening usually allow us to predict the way we're gonna follow up babies for a very long time. And one of the major screening that I perform in newborn screening is a screening for specific genetic condition at birth. Before we propose to do a testing for, to any person, we ask a few questions. And one of the most important questions is that, is 
doing this testing will help my patient. And, and, and it's important every single time to ask as a professional that question. And if the answer is that this may allow us to reduce the complication of the disease, perhaps to reduce the mortality of the disease through appropriate treatment, yes, that means that the testing will uh, help. If it is, the testing may allow me uh, to uh, reduce the amounts of surveillance that one person needs by rule out, ruling out one specific condition, that means the testing will help. If the testing may allow a couple to know uh, the future or, and plan properly a future a reproductive career, uh, having children with or without a condition, that means the testing can help. But the other question is, will the genetic testing hurt my patient? There are some conditions like the Huntington disease, a very terrible neurodegenerative condition. You have a normal life and you start losing your mind, losing your capacity to work, losing your memory, uh, in the, you are mid 30 or mid 40, sometimes patients don't want to know. They want to just live their life. Whatever happens, happens. In those situations, you don't necessarily want to test your patient. If the testing may be an issue of insurance discrimination associated, for example, with high risk of cancer for a test for a patient, you may not want to test that patient. And of course, if the testing may lead to family discords, uh, in some specific condition, uh, you may not want to test that patient. The reason why every single genetic testing have to go with a proper counseling between you and the patient to make sure that all these questions are being addressed. And uh, the pre-test counseling and informed consent is a requirement for all the genetic testing that we do. And usually we're gonna do a risk assessment before and after the testing. And there are three types of risk that we assess. The one is called Mendelian risk. For example, in a family with cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease, those conditions are inherited as autosomal recessive. So that means that for a couple at risk of having a child with those conditions, the risk of having a child every single time would be 25%. So the Mendelian risk are actually mathematical. The second type of risk is what we call modified genetic risk. For example, if you have a condition that is late onset, Huntington disease or a specific cancer, if you live up to 90% or 90 years old without a breast cancer, if you have a specific variant in your family, that means that your risk is very low. But if you are only 40, your risk is still high. So your age will be used to modify your a priori risk that is 50% initially. So it's called a modified risk. And the third type of risk is called empiric risk. It's not it's just based on epidemiology. For example, we know that if you have someone with cleft leaf and palate in a family, the chances for that very same family to have a second child is about 2.5%. It's just based on statistics. And based on those three types of risks, we're gonna communicate the risk to the family, whether they want to proceed with the testing or not. And the counseling, also, it's important to evaluate the risk perception because we are all framed differently. Some of us are very optimistic. Some of us are very pessimistic. And the perception of risk is very different from one person to the next. We need to explore the expectation from the testing and the support system on the individual. Is the person living with his parent? If the person have a partner of la in life? If the person have friends around him? that will support in case there is a need of support after a testing. And uh, we have to evaluate with the client or the patient, the implication of testing or not being tested. We need to evaluate the testing accuracy and communicate on it because not all testing are 100% sensitive or 100% specific. 
and we need to uh, provide planning to convey the result. From some time to time, you may want to test the patient. And in some condition, you also need to ask the patient, do you really want to know the result of the testing before you provide it? And it's critical to maintain a high level of confidentiality. The principle here of the counseling uh, is to explain the facts in the words that everyone are able to understand. So you need to measure your language and your words according to the level of understanding of your patient. You have to take the necessary time and see the patient again if they need to be. Your advice needs to be absolutely non-directive. The patient needs to, to have the level of autonomy to take his own decision. It is important to respect the right to not to know and to uh, really, uh, specifically in, in, in pre-symptomatic condition like Huntington disease. You need to address some ethical uh, implication around uh, the, the testing. You need to address emotional status of the patient and perhaps the feel of being the, the gear feeling because in some family, if a condition is running, some people that will not have the change or the mutation can feel guilty not to have it. And you have to address those uh, conditions. You need to ensure privacy and confidentiality for all the time. And usually for children, uh, unless, there is, unless there is a direct benefit, we usually prefer not to test uh, children. And usually when we finish the counseling and the consultation, we summarize uh, the content of the counseling in a letter to the family, and that because that letter can be uh, used from generation to generation. As you know, a genetic condition runs into family and always good to summarize what you said. What are the potential problem in our genetic consultation and, and counseling? The first is to keep the, 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 to keep the, the pace for knowledge. And as I told you every single day, we have new disease gene. We still have 70% of gene for which we don't yet have a clear association with a threat of the disease. So it's always an open book consultation for geneticists. You have to be up to date every single day. The second uh, issue is the, an unexpected finding. It is possible that you may, by investigating one patient, you may found some other risk that you haven't planned or the family uh, disease, family variation running, or non-paternity, for example. It is possible that uh, the length that is needed for some of the testing that may take weeks or months may be difficult for patient to accommodate. And from time to time, there may be some conflict of interest to address, for example, with uh, insurances. So I'll now, provide with a few specific examples on um, the type of uh, condition that we see in, in, in genetics medicine. Uh, the first uh, panel represents reproductive medicine. So we will see couple at risk or women for uh, Down syndrome risk, for example, advanced maternal age. Advanced maternal age doesn't mean that the individual is old. It just means that if someone, a woman is more than 35, the risk for chromosomal abnormality increase. We have people with recurrent miscarriages, uh, more than two. We also couple with infertility that have not been explained. We will see a woman uh, that have a premature menopause. In our pediatric genetic consultation, we will see uh, children with congenital malformation. Uh, intellectual disability, speech delay, failure to grow, and also what we earlier called dysmorphic sign. That means those specific changes uh, that are unusual. In uh, our neurogenetic uh, clinic, we will see patients with movement disorder or with muscle disorder. And most of you are familiar with oncogenetic uh, clinic, like for example, genes like BRCA1 or 2 associated with breast cancer. Some other genes are associated with familial uh, colon uh, cancer. And many other rare diseases can be uh, seen by geneticists from various clinics, including ophthalmology, cardiology, or endocrinology. 
this is one example of a specific condition during uh, our reproductive medicine. This is a family with uh, the risk for a sickle cell disease. And uh, this family, uh, as uh, you may not read well, but below the pedigree is written GP and GP. GP means diagnostic prenatal for those that can speak uh, French. These are family that we actually saw, so it's not a real life story. Another example, a young woman that came because her sister have a newborn with Down syndrome and she want to know, is there any risk for me to have a Down syndrome? That means that we need to go back to the sister folder to make sure that we have a Cardiotype, the chromosome analysis of the child with Down syndrome, and to know if that form uh, of that Down syndrome is potentially can run into family and so on. Case of Down syndrome doesn't run in family, so I have to stress on that. This is a family with intellectual disability, uh, and in that specific family, uh, we did, there was a diagnostic of uh, fragile X syndrome that needed to be excluded. This is a specific condition associated with intellectual disability. And the why do I need to speak today uh, with you and to convey this message is because 71% of American adults say that they will most likely ask their primary care physician about genetic disorder present in their family. So you are not going to come to a geneticist first. You ask the question uh, to your uh, family doctor. And uh, to ask the appropriate question, uh, the general public will need to be educated what type of question uh, need to be asked. So it's really a, a, a triangular relation between the primary care uh, physician, uh, the patient, and the genetic professional. And we need this communication, which is these three components to optimally serve the patient the way they deserve. This was my last slide. I would like to thank you for your very kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Wonka. Very interesting. Um, just a tremendous amount of information there and very understandable. So thank you so much. So let's get started with the questions, all right? <clears throat> so you talked just for a, a minute about the the BRCA gene or the BRCA1 and BRCA2. So Lisa wants to know, are there new mutations that have been identified as increasing the risk of breast cancer? With either yes, one they're, of they're absolutely. One. Yeah. There are numerous genes uh, beside BRCA1 and 2. One that I can think of is, for example, P53 genes, the Czech gene, PBLA2 genes. So there are numerous genes. Actually, and today for as a geneticist, we have what we call panel in which all those genes can be tested at once. But of course, BLCA1 and 2 by far is the most represented in as genes that may be associated with inheritable breast cancer and mm -hmm. also in ovarian cancer. So thank you, uh, Dr. Wonkum. So if uh, so, where would you go to get those specific tests done? Do you go to your primary care physician? Where where would you go to get those tests done, those genetic tests done? I think the the, the first point of call is your primary care physician that mm -hmm. probably would be the first to evaluate if there is a need to do those testing, and if the primary care physician. Uh, can uh, they will refer you to a geneticist. You can also ask the primary care physician if you need to see a geneticist. And usually we will be very happy uh, to see uh, those patients and family. Great. So would that go for any genetic testing, not just for breast cancer genetic testing, but really any genetic testing? Same protocol. Absolutely. That will go for any genetic testing. But we are very much aware that there is a direct uh, to consumer testing where people just send sample to specific lab and have the result. It's not the optimal scenario because those results usually are not interpretable. And usually there is no pre-test counseling as we discussed because it's critical to know uh, if the test will really help and mm -hmm. also explain what is found after the testing. So ideally, we want to see our patient before, have an appropriate genetic counseling before we can ask for a testing. Great. Thank you very much for that. 
Uh, Shania wants to, to know though, what if you don't have any family to ask about your genetic history? What if it's, you know, just you, right? And there's, there's absolutely no family or there's other instances that, you know, perhaps you were, um, you know, uh, adopted or other, other things that you did um, and you just don't have any, anybody to ask. Is there a way then to get tested? Absolutely. We, we did say we have like three step in our, actually four step in the way we, we, we do our practice. The first is the family history. If the family history is not there, the second step is the clinical examination of the patient and to look for any signs, any changes that may uh, call for a genetic investigation. The next step is based on those to see if we can have other input from other physicians as other specialists. And based on the combination of the tree, we can request a genetic testing. So the family uh, tree and information is critical, but it's not an absolute requirement for genetic testing. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. So how do you feel about those home genetic test kits? You know, there's so many of them out there, right? You know, they're, they're advertised on TV all the time. And um, what do you, how do you feel about those? Home genetic tests. How accurate do you? Do you... I can well imagine Kedila not thought that good because I do. I do not think not all those testing really help the patient. Uh, we have seen tons of patients coming to our clinic with pages and pages of results that they have received, and every single day actually, uh, and they cannot read it properly. They cannot interpret it properly because, of course, <laughs> the pre-test counseling never really happened. And uh, now you have to face those information that sometimes create more anxiety. Ideally, it's always good to see at least your primary care physician before you engage in a genetic testing. Okay, good to know because there's just so much out there, right? All the, you go on anything on the internet or in the media, anywhere. It's, it's just, you know, home testing for this, that, and the other. And so it's really nice to know to hear from you. Um, that's probably not the way to go. Go to, your, go to your primary care physician first. So our next question is from Lisa and she, her question is, with an APC finding, is it a good idea to see a geneticist? Now, and, and if you will describe what an APC finding is to the audience, that would be great. APC is a gene uh, associated with multiple uh, polyps. Uh, polyps are little tumor that may grow in the in intestine. And the, first of all, the, the first thing to know is the findings associated, is it a pathological findings? In other words, is the changes in the genes is the one that we can link to the development of specific pathology associated with that gene specifically at the cancers uh, of the colon. Uh, of course, if there is a change in those, it's critical to get followed by a specialist oncologist and gastroenterologist that will need to do a few tests like colonoscopy on a very regular basis uh, to continue checking if there is any changes in the digestive tube and, uh, and that may allow preventative removal of those changes and keep uh, surveillance uh, for, for some time, actually a very long time. And, uh, we also know that there are some medication just in case uh, there is some risk that may reduce that risk. And some of those medications are as simple as aspirin. Very good, interesting. Thank you, Dr. Wankum. Our next question is from Susan and she'd like to know, are there some examples where you have the genes for a specific disease, but it takes something in the, in the environment to trigger it? You spoke about that. She'd like to know, are there actual specific, specific diseases that, you know, that it would take something in the environment to trigger the disease? Yeah, there, there, there are many, many of those ones, actually. There are some variations that are associated, for example, to the metabolism of sugar. So if only if you eat some specific sugar that, uh, for example, associated with uh, the, the metabolism that happened in the, in, in the liver, the way we identify those children is usually because the liver become very, very big. Um, there, there are some other conditions like porphyria that is, again, that associated with the specific food that you may eat. There are some conditions like G6PG in the tropics that is associated with 
a specific medication against malaria that you may take and so on. So there are numerous of those that, uh, that completely change the that completely change according to the environment. Of course, the, the obvious one in terms of complex diseases is, is diabetes mellitus. You may be in the family from generation to generation that have diabetes, but if you maintain a good quality of life, a lower intake of the sugar and also a high level of exercise, you may never see it developing yourself. It's great advice. It seems diet and exercise always plays an enormous role in anything that we do. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Wankum, our next question is from Rachel. And her question is, um, Jewish young adults are encouraged to do genetic testing for several genetic diseases, including cystic fibrosis. Are there other common genetic tests that couples thinking about having children should consider? The, the, the first part of the question, I didn't hear very well. Okay, the first part is, um, Jewish young adults are encouraged to do genetic testing for several genetic diseases, including cystic fibrosis. Yes. Then she asks, are there other common genetic tests that couples thinking about having children should consider? Yes, I think the, I think the way to answer the question uh, is to start by saying that genetic variation changes according to the population and also you know, the proportion of genetic variations of some of the genetic variation changes according to the population and the region of the world where people come from. For example, if you are coming from Congo, the most common genetic condition there is sickle cell disease. If you are coming from the Middle East, one of the most common genetic condition is of course a thalassemia. If you are from Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, there's a series of condition that may be most common in that specific group of population, as you say to yourself, including cystic fibrosis. If you are from Southeast Asia, a condition called alpha thalassemia is by far the most common. And of course, so if a couple arrive to our clinic, the, usually we're gonna take the family tree and asking for the origin of both couple from both sides, uh, including their grandparents. And based on that origin, and based on uh, the profile of uh, genetic condition associated with that origin, we may uh, advise a specific screening that can be provided. Wow, so it really does matter from really, what your uh, background history is and where you're from, very important to you know talk over with when, usually when people are coming in and you're filling out those forms when you come into your doctor's office, you know, and there are all those questions and you know, a lot of patients, you know, including myself sometimes will go in there and go, oh, you know, because it could be very lengthy. But this is such good information from you to know how important it is. Every one of those questions that are being asked are for a reason. Okay. Yeah, because it paints the picture, like you said, which I love. You said it, it's it's the book, it's your it's the library, it's your library of life, and it, it couldn't be any truer. That that really that really puts everything in perspective. So, our, yeah, our next question uh, coming in from uh, this is from Katya is: Do you know if autism also follows a specific type of inheritance pattern? So in other words, multifactorial things like schizophrenia or bipolar, can you find this in within the genetic testing? I guess they're asking where do you find some kind of inherent, you know, pattern when you're looking yes. at autism. Let, let's let's speak to autism. Uh, for okay. example, if you look most of the children that uh, has uh, autism, there is a huge disproportionate proportion of boys compared to girls with autism. And that already put an indication that there might be some form of genetics there uh, because right. boys and girls are different because of the sex chromosomes. In girls, we have two Xs and in boys, we have one called X, another one called Y that makes them boy. So for a very long time, many geneticists thought that the truth might be on chromosome X because the boys have only one of those. Perhaps the autism is more common because of that condition. It's the condition that we spoke to called fragile X syndrome. Actually, part that condition is associated with intellectual disability, which is not the case for most autistic uh, children. 
but the behavior in that condition looks like in some form of so is there any genetic specific genetic genes associated with autism the answer is yes there are some rare cases specifically the highly functioning autistic what was called asperger syndrome there have been a few uh, genes associated with it but most cases most cases of autism that we see is difficult to pinpoint one specific variation even though there are a lot of clues uh, indicating that at the end of the day there is a lot of genetic variation contributing to autism but not necessarily but less of the environmental variation but mostly genetic variation so would you recommend or can you uh, do genetic testing before you're going to ha have children before you think about you know having children to see if you carry that type of gene or uh, there is there is no such thing as that I wouldn't say that there is such thing. I, I, let's say we know that there are few genes that have been associated with autism, but at the research level, but most of those genes very rarely are used in clinical practice. But having said that, having evaluated family, and if we have the impression that in that specifically there's a pattern uh, of inheritance of condition associated with intellectual disability, we can well explore some that can be explored in practice, like fragile X syndrome, and uh, advise the patient or the client appropriately. So would you say then that, that anyone having children, this is a question um, from Barb, if anyone's thinking about having children, sh should they think about just getting genetically tested? I mean, I, it's kind of opening Pandora's box, right? Like you talked, to, talked about that a little bit, like you, you need to be careful uh, about getting genetic testing, meaning, uh, you know, I would imagine, you know, are, are you, what, what will you do with the answers, right? And, yeah. uh, or, you, or you just want to, or you just want to wait, you know, like, like, you know, most people probably have all these years, right? It's kind of, how do you weigh this now? Because science is becoming so specific now, and especially, you know, genetically here, what you're, what you're speaking about this evening. I tend to say that 88% of children, 98% actually, of children that are born out there are all very normal. Statistically, so we say have- Say that again, 80, did you say 80%? 98% of children that are born out there are very much normal. It's, we know statistically that it's only about 2.5% of children that will have some changes, whether it's a malformation or a, a specific condition at birth. So it will be overstating to say everybody that need to have children will need to go for to see a geneticist. The answer is no, no, not necessarily, because in most cases, as we say, they are, they are most all normal. But it may be that in some specific condition, for example, we spoke about maternal age. If you are closer to, 30, to 35 or more, Yes, it's advisable that at least for those conditions associated with increased maternal age, you get the necessary screening. That actually is given, is provided in all women anyway, in, in most places in the world. Wow. Um, if there is a need, a, a, a need for you based on your own family or personal history, if you have recurrent miscarriages, if there is anyone in the family with, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, intellectual disability, if there is a close relative with a malformation, yes, you may want to go to see a geneticist uh, before you can plan your reproductive career. So on, uh, with that, where do you see, uh, um, we've, we've got maybe about uh, 45 seconds here before we have to end our hour, but where would you, uh, where can you find a, a geneticist at, uh, at Hopkins? I think we, we are very happy to welcome you in our Department of Genetic Medicine. We have, have a whole bunch of very, very widely competent geneticists. It's easy to see our contact on the website. And uh, we also have a team of genetic counselor and genetic assistant that will be happy to help you even just on phone or by email to address some of your questions even before you arrive to our clinic. Wonderful. That sounds great. 
Well, on that note, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Wonko. Thank you so much for being my guest this evening. I've, I've just, I've learned so much. Um, it's just, it, it's really incredible information. And uh, so thank you again for speaking with us this evening. And thank you for all of you for joining us. And in the coming days, a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash A Women's Journey under videos on demand. And if you'd enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash A Women's Journey for more information about upcoming webinar webinars, our insights that matter, podcast series, and sign up for our monthly emails. Good night and stay well.